Hello, everyone. Thank you all so much for taking time out of your Friday evening to be here with us. Our ASID UCLA Extension Chapter has been working really hard to uh, plan some innovative and fun um, additional learning opportunities for all of you guys. And um, tonight we have Brett Parsons, which we are so excited about. Um, Brett Parsons is an author. He has written five books. Um, he is also the founder and executive director of the architectural division of Beverly Hills Compass. So thank you so much, Brett, for being here with us tonight. Um, and we are excited to hear about the wonderful Paul Revere Williams, which is one of LA's best architects. Um, so thank you so much for being here. You know, I don't know if he's one of, he may be the best. Oh, we're excited yeah. to see. Absolutely fantastic. I know you're going to ask me a few questions, but the program will mainly be on Paul Williams. I've got about 40 pictures that I'll quickly go through. Um, the man is deserving of 30 years of, of scholarship as opposed to 30 minutes, but I think everybody will get a, at least a thumbnail um, uh, sketch of, of this brilliant architect that, you know, is basically, you know, LA's best architectural export. There's no doubt about it. Thank you so much. We're so excited. And another exciting uh, piece of information about Brett is that um, Brett was the executive director of ASID Los Angeles. Can you tell us about your experience um, in that role and what that was like? Sure. I it, Actually, it was one of my favorite jobs I've ever had. I graduated from college, came to LA, and my dad finally said it's Actually, he used some expletives, which he never did, but he said it was effing time to get a job. And so I went to U the UCLA job uh, uh, department and the ASID executive director job was posted. This would have been 1987, 1987. Yeah. And I looked at that, well, this sure looks like a fun job because I've always loved houses. And I uh, interviewed with two ASID board members in 87. They hired me right away. And I began basically January 2nd, 1988. My office was in the design center, suite M52 on the mezzanine. And I was there three years. And it was one of my most favorite jobs I've ever had. I, I'm still in touch with many of the board members and the members at large and whatnot, but we, we actively worked with the students then. It was, it, we, were, we were extraordinarily robust. We were kind of at the end of that era, uh, which had about five or six more years to go, but it was a very exciting industry. It was hustle and bustle and very different than it is now, but it was, it was remarkable. It was a wonderful, wonderful introduction. That's so amazing to hear too, that that was in the eighties. And I mean, oh, yeah. in 2021 and, you know, a lot of the, you know, I'm sure people are still familiar with the same, you know, the, everything that's at the design center and, um, you know, everyone has like lifelong friends, I feel like, um, you know, that you make in, your, in that, in, at the PDC. You know, it really was the hub. Everything happened there. There, not, there weren't too many showrooms on the boulevards. Um, it was, you know, PDC was the hub and it was only the blue building at the time. The green building was being built. But when I started, it was just the blue and it was packed. Oh, it was packed, yeah. And that's before, um, you know, La Cienega and Melrose, all of that did not exist at that time, correct? Well, no, it, well, it existed and it always had design flavor, but the hub of it was all in the design center. It's very different now. It's dispersed uh, to many parts of town. Um, it, it, it's not like it was. It is not like it was. Definitely. Well, thank you so much for sharing that. That's so wonderful sure. to hear. Um, now, you're also an author of five books. Um, and you started back in 2008 with Colcord. Um, can you tell us about your journey and how your love of homes and architecture led to writing and uh, well, being sure. an author? Well, the one sentence version is I finished up with ASID and then I became uh, a leasing agent for Pacific Design Center. I think I was the vice president of business development at one point, and that was exciting. And that took me to about 2000. And then I had had my fill. You know, I was had been at it for about 12, 13 years. And then I decided I need to do something new. And I was a mortgage broker for 10 years. And I did that. And then at the end of that, I discovered the archives of a, a very famous but not very well-known architect by the name of Gerard Colcord. And the family would probably have just thrown the archives away. But I saw the archives and thought, there's a book here. 
And it took exactly two years. It was published on my on uh, two years later on my birthday, actually. And Cold Court Home came out. And when the book came out, a lady that I had interviewed for the book said, you know, you love my house so much. And I know you're, you're licensed because you're a mortgage broker. Why don't you sell my house? And I said, okay. And that was the sign I needed to become a realtor. So after 10 years of mortgage brokering, I took two years off to do the book. And then I became a realtor. And that was just about 10 years ago. I, I honestly wish I'd done it 10 years earlier. You know, we all have that, you know, woulda, coulda, shoulda, you know, attitude. Oh, yeah. Um, but it's been very good to me. I, I wish I had started out as a realtor, but these other uh, offshoots really, you know, it paved the way for a, for a, a really strong foundation. And then, and then of course, uh, four more books came out. I linked up with um, uh, Mark Appleton, a very prominent architect. And then we have guest researchers, Eleanor Schrader uh, being one of them and Steve Vaught and Stephen G. And uh, they've really, we're up to four volumes now and they've taken off. They've been very, very well received. Amazing. We yep. are so honored to have you, especially five books is beyond impressive. So congratulations on that accomplishment. Now, I'm only a third of it. You know, each book, it, it's a third, a third, a third, but it, 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 it makes me very happy. You know, sometimes at two in the morning, I'm writing and, and, and I'm totally blissed out. Uh, but the book, uh, the first one we did was on Gordon Kaufman, who known for Greystone and Beverly Hills and Hoover Dam and the LA Times building downtown. And then we did Roland Coate who is known as the father of the Monterey Colonial Revival. And then we shifted to Wallace Neff, uh, did some of the, the best indigenous looking architecture in California. And then we just recently wrapped up Paul Williams and it was a very happy coincidence, uh, but it uh, coincided with Black History Month. We had no idea. It just, you know, I think there were bigger powers uh, uh, handling things and the book arrived February 1st. Amazing. Yeah, I actually tried to get it in the month of February and it was sold out. So oh, I, yeah. now I now I think it's coming, you know, back in stock and um but I'm I'm definitely gonna place an order um because I couldn't get it in February. <laughs> and um which now leads us into the perfect um you know next question. Can you share with us the incredible story and incredible and inspiring story of Paul Revere Williams? Ab absolutely. Now everyone out there, please know that literally this is less than 30 minutes. For a man who deserves you know 30 years of, of, of scholarship um but i'm going to go very very quickly there are going to be many many bits i'm going to uh, gloss over but you're going to get a real thumbnail on who this genius was he's just remarkable the best aspect of paul williams why you know he's good is he has stood the test of time i think his projects are even more popular today than they ever were when he built them uh which that's always you know the proof is in the pudding is 50 years later what do people think about you know, the person. And he is, it's interesting, his middle name is Revere after Paul Revere, and he is a revered architect. So I am going to hit screen share, and we're going to go right to, is Paul Williams looking at everybody? Yes. Are we good? Okay, fantastic. Again, I am doing the thumbnail version. But here's Mr. Paul Revere Williams. This was later in his career. He was, he was born, I believe, about 1896. Uh, excuse me, 1894. He would die in 1980. And he was a legend in every possible way. But here's, a, here's an official shot of him uh, at his office. Uh, just such a distinguished and elegant man. Here he is in his younger days. He's probably about 25 years of age. Um, he was an extraordinary student. He showed uh, tremendous artistic skills. He would later learn how to draw upside down because in those days, a white client could not sit next to a black man, black person. And so he would draw upside down. It was considered socially correct that you could be sitting across from each other at a desk, but you couldn't be sitting side by side. So he was on one side, his clients were on the other, and he literally drew their home upside down, which was an amazing feat, which of course won him many clients. He started out with uh, in John Austin's office downtown, and he was a prominent Los Angeles architect and saw the talent with this young man and hired him right away. They did many projects together, and it helps that Paul Williams started at the top. Paul Williams, because he was black, he became very prominent very quickly. He entered competitions, because when you enter a competition, they don't know your skin color. They just know your name. 
and he kept winning competition after competition, and that cemented his name as far as being an extraordinary architect. You know, he learned to adapt. There was this tremendous talent in him that was going to get out no matter what, and he made it happen. Here's a sketch he did for a house, and what's very interesting is he innovated the aspect of realizing that people kind of wasted their backyards. And so what he did is he turned more of the living towards the backyard with big open windows and whatnot that made people uh, you know, enjoy the backyard. He, he moved rooms that were typically at the front of the house to the back of the house. And that way he could uh, basically increase the value of the property and he could serve a lot more needs on the property with uh, different activities and whatnot. But he was very, very innovative. And of course, look at his artwork. Look what he could do with his hand and a pencil. Isn't it beautiful? Here's the man that gave him a big start. This is Senator Flint. Now, th think in terms of Senator Flint. And when I say Flint Ridge, uh, an area that's close to Pasadena in the foothills, uh, you'll realize this is the Senator Flint was the man who was responsible for developing La Cañada, actually Flint Ridge, which would later turn into La Cañada Flint Ridge. And he hired Paul Williams, who did many of the homes that are still there today. Uh, La Cañada Flint Ridge, it's, it's beautiful country estates, most are on acreage, a very town and country kind of lifestyle, obviously the country part, very affluent, prestigious, elegant and whatnot. And this is Senator Flint who developed the area and hired Paul Williams. One of Paul Williams' early projects is the Second Baptist Church downtown. Um, it was built at a cost of about two hundred and fifty thousand, which was a fortune then. But it's but it's interesting. I believe this was about uh, nineteen oh five, right in that era, and the mandate was all the vendors had to be black owned businesses, and all the all the um, craftspeople had to be black as well. What I find so interesting is ninety five years ago that mandate was in place. That mandate is in place again today, and isn't it interesting how far we've come? But in a lot of ways, we really haven't come that far. You know, for for the race issue to still be discussed 95 years later, after this building was built with the black mandate, you know, you you you've got to take pause and realize, yeah, we've made strides, but we need to do a lot more work. But is that an absolutely beautiful building? Still, still, still in existence? Is it still in downtown, Brett? Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, amazing. Yeah. Um, right here, we're going to shift all over LA very quickly. This is the first uh, uh, residence that Paul Williams did in Hancock Park. Hancock Park was a new community in the 20s, and everybody confuses Hancock Park. They, they call a great big area Hancock Park, but Hancock Park is basically uh, Windsor Square, Windsor Village, Brookside, Fremont Place, and Hancock Park. Hancock Park being the newest of those areas. And what distinguishes Hancock Park from the others is the, the lots were larger. Many of these lots are, are a half uh, an acre to an acre, and they were more generous. Uh, the homes are bigger. It's probably the most expensive area of, of what people consider to be Hancock Park. But this was the first home that he did in Hancock Park proper. We're going to zip off to the entrance uh, that beautiful Chigaresque uh, entrance detail. Now, this was a man, I doubt if he was even 30 years old when he was designing these homes. These, they're magnificent, they've stood the test of time. They're actually timeless. You have no idea what date to put on this building. We're gonna shift to Beverly Hills and show you a beautiful uh, one-story Tudor that he did. This is actually on Whittier, but the, but the contrasting house right next door is the Lon Chaney Mansion. Now, isn't it interesting that one man can beautifully handle Tudor and then he can also do a Georgian revival? This home here was built for Lon Chaney, the famous, Lon Chaney Sr., the famous actor. I think they called him the man of a thousand faces. He was just an extraordinary actor. Um, he would build this house, but he would die before he moved into it. And if any of you watch the Spectrum TV network, uh, next week we'll be airing an interview in this house. This is one of Paul Williams' finest Georgians, and this is on Whittier as well, right next door to the Tudor. But I just want you to see, here we go from jolly old England, and I mean, this could be on the Italian Riviera. It's absolutely magnificent. 
Um, one thing I want to call out, notice the very steep roof. You can, off, you can often tell the origin of a home's architecture by the roof. When you have a steep roof, that meant the home was in an area with a lot of rainfall. Notice the pitch of that roof. The higher the, or the steeper the pitch, the faster it will, it will repel rainwater. This home here, which typically could have been in the, in the um, south of France or Italy or whatnot, it has a much uh, lower pitch. That's because the rainfall isn't nearly as abundant. Uh, as opposed to uh, England. So if you look at the pitch of the roof, you can often tell the origin of the house based on rainfall. We're gonna shift over to Pasadena right now. Here's the Adkins Mansion that was built for a reported cost of about a half a million dollars in the 20s. Keep in mind that a typical Hancock Park mansion an extraordinary, elegant, desirable mansion was $50,000. That got you the best house of all. This one was $500,000. The architecture is absolutely sublime. We're gonna go inside, look at all that Tudor detailing. And of course, you've gotta have the, the panel den. Um, we're gonna go back with um, this house here, unfortunately burned down in a fire in 2005. And lots of people uh, confuse this house as the home that they use for Batman. That was another house very close by. This was never used for Batman the TV series. Here's the Cord Mansion in Beverly Hills. Uh, it's um, uh, just right off of uh, Doheny Road, kind of uh, northeastern Beverly Hills. This one was famous because Paul Williams entered a competition and or actually a, 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 a gentleman's competition with the, the man who commissioned the house, Mr. Cord, uh, manufacturer of the Cord automobile. And he uh, uh, gave Paul Williams, or Paul Williams said, you'll have plans for your new mansion within 24 hours. That's unheard of. And of course, the owner didn't believe it, but said, sure, go ahead. And 24 hours later, the plans and the sketches for this home were produced for Mr. Cord. Mr. Cord hired Mr. Williams, and look at this magnificent mansion. It's a Southern colonial with stables. And of course, the pool. Pools were rare in, the day, in that day. Here's the inside. While the furniture looks antique, it was all just good reproduction furniture from department stores. Um, this is the house that's actually on the cover of the Paul Williams book. This is reportedly Paul Williams' favorite house, a, a, a French um, uh, neo re it, it, Actually, it's a French revival um, with many, many details. You know, Paul Williams could blend a, you know, a disparate uh, blending of elements and just make it all seem as if it was completely original. The house looks exactly the same today. It, the picture was taken from 6th Street, which today is a highway, but in the day it was a country road. It's one block away from the uh, mayor's house where Mayor Garcetti lives. Here's the house today. I mean, it has not changed other than the tree has grown. I'll go back. If you look at the sycamore tree on the left, the branch on the left, that's the one today. It's it just it 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 you walk by or drive by you just want to stare at it. It's so pleasant and peaceful. It you know it hits every note. It's perfect. The proportion, the scale, the design. It's remarkable. This one's been getting a lot of press in the news lately. This is the Paley Mansion in Homeby Hills, and this was built for Jay Paley, who was an executive at CBS uh, Radio. Um, Television hadn't quite emerged yet. Radio was the communications industry. And you've got a beautiful George, a painted brick Georgian uh, that's in uh, Homeby Hills. It's probably on about two acres now. It's been whittled down through the years. And of course, there's the gate on the right. And if any of you remember the Colby's television series, they used this house for that. The Colby's was an offshoot of Dynasty with John James. We're inside of the beautiful Art Deco bar room. These homes were highly stylized. I mean, every single inch of detailing was perfected. And there's the bar right there. Isn't that beautiful? And this is the famous pool. It's the Zodiac pool. It was done by uh, Paddock Pool Construction. They were the famous pool builders of the day. And if you look at the design, that is the, the, um, uh, the Zodiac uh, with the 12 astrological signs. Um, portrayed in tile in the pool. And isn't that a beautiful uh, terrace that basically is balanced over the pool? It's probably one of the most beautiful pools in the world. 
Um, right here, this is the uh, MCA building. You should drive by this. This is on Burton Way in Beverly Hills. It is exquisitely maintained. Normally that gate you're looking at is opened and it's a public park that you can sit and have lunch in. Uh, this was one of Paul Williams' uh, most exquisite creations. The uh, MCA executives, they wanted a building that looked as if it was a very grand, elegant residence, not an office building. Paul Williams was innovative. He also did, uh, while, the, while his home looks rather traditional and whatnot, it's actually made of steel. It was entered into a competition and all the siding is steel. Paul Williams was innovative. He was always looking to explore the uses of different materials and forms and function and whatnot. But you'd swear that's a clabbered house, but that's actually steel. With the home exhibition, uh, besides the steel house, he also did the French house. And you know this just classic French design, which actually today it was it was moved from the exhibition site on Wilshire Boulevard where the public could tour, and then it was moved to Plymouth Boulevard just south of Wilshire in Windsor Village. It looks exactly the same today, other than a big hedge grown up. Um, you know, when homes last a hundred years, that tells you the design was good to begin with. This is Be Beverly Hills. And notice all the, 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 the blending of all the different architectural styles, and yet it, it, it's absolutely seamless. We're going to go inside right now. Um, Paul Williams enjoyed light, of course, and he always was striving to let light into these homes. However, this is a home on a residential lot very close to the neighbors, so he used glass block brick as a window. Now it's totally private, but it lets the window, it lets the light in with absolutely no problem. On the left is one of his signature staircases. It always has a curve and a beautiful detailing to it. The fascinating thing about staircases is they're very ceremonial. Um, they, they designate between private life and public life. Your friends can visit you on the first floor, but you need to be invited up to the second floor. That's the symbology of a staircase. It basically, it's a demarcation line between public and private life. To get upstairs, you're invited. There's the house today. I mean, nearly a hundred years later, it's absolutely perfect. Isn't that fantastic? Beautiful. Yeah. If my memory serves me correct, it's on Roxbury, just south of Wilshire. And, and this picture was taken fairly recently. This is how it's maintained. This one, unfortunately, has a sad ending. It's, it's absolutely magnificent. You're looking at Toluca Lake. Yes, there really is a lake in, in Toluca Lake, California. And this was done by Williams in the mid 30s. This was done for a female screenwriter. And in those days, she couldn't use her female name. So she did screenplays under a male name so that nobody would know that a woman was writing because a woman's work was not as respected as a man's work. So she, in a way, was like Paul Williams. She cut to the chase and got through the system and became very, very successful. And nobody knew that she was a woman. Now, this is a, obviously a Tudor revival. It's got every book. Unfortunately, it was torn down just last year. The lot is very, very expensive. It's very desirable. It's in a beautiful residential area. And look at the lake that it overlooks. I can understand why someone would buy it and tear it down. On the other hand, why would you possibly want to tear down a piece of art? Here we go inside. Look at the detailing with the staircase. And then um, the room next to the staircase is actually portrayed larger on the right. The beautiful parquet uh, uh, flooring. The room is actually oval. The room serves as a transition to get you from the entry hall into the dining room or the living room. Paul Williams was a big believer on vestibules introducing the larger room ahead. So it's sort of like the introduction to a book. Uh, here we, we shift over to Sunset Boulevard. This was the home of one of the creators of Amos and Andy, a very famous uh, radio show. And I don't want you to memorize the rooms, that's not important, but just look at those floor plans of that home, the first and second floor. Notice the curves and the ovals and the straight lines and look how elegant and harmoniously they blend into each other. He was a very, very skilled architect. He understood human nature, he understood human bodies. He knew how bodies wanted to move. He he thought of everything for a home because a home has to serve many people for different reasons. And if you just look at the, at the shapes, you realize this is a very elegant jigsaw puzzle in a way that, that works absolutely flawlessly. It really is remarkable. 
Here's a picture of that indoor entry hall. And notice again, the stairway, again, very ceremonial, it's very beautiful. You know, lots of women like being married on staircases because they can come to the balcony upstairs, announce themselves, and they can, can slowly cascade down the staircase. Uh, it's just a very elegant way to introduce yourself. Paul Williams also did public housing. He just he didn't do just homes for the rich and the famous. Uh, this still exists. This was public housing. And again, this has the architect's touch. There's some elegance. What's interesting is the Pueblo del Rio, that's actually his own handwriting. His logo was made from his handwriting, which is very similar to the Beverly Hills Hotel. And that logo, that was also his handwriting. And Paul Williams was the man that did the major renovation to the hotel after Elmer Gray did the original building at the turn of the century. And here's Paul Williams with an associate and he was very collaborative. He worked with many other architects. You're looking at Quincy Jones, actually A, initial A period, Quincy Jones, a famous modernist who started off in the Paul Williams office. Um, this is the uh, Paul, Palm Springs Racquet Club, and this was a, a major project. This is the dining room section, uh, but notice, this is Palm Springs, obviously, but notice the curves, the oval pool, just the elegance and how the architecture fits the shape of the mountain. It looks as if it was always there. It looks like it's an outcropping from the mountain. You know, God does things perfectly. It's mankind who screws everything up. But when you look at what God did, and I'm not talking about religion, I'm talking spirituality. But if you look at what God did, basically you're a guest in God's home. You know, revere it, no pun intended with Paul Revere Williams' name, but really your, your environment will tell you what it wants to do and be. Don't put a Tudor house here. This is, this is a desert with a mountain. The architecture perfectly complements the environment. And this is always the talent of a very skilled architect. Look inside, here's the bar overlooking the pool. Look at that sinuous bar, that line that curves and cascades. It follows the mountain. It's a very, very elegant way of tipping its hat to the environment. We're in Pacific Palisades now. Paul Williams was one of the few architects that made the tradition from traditional into modern. Uh, before World War II, we were very traditionally um, oriented with our, all our revival styles, English revival, French revival, Spanish revival, Mediterranean revival. But after World War II, we wanted different things. We were victorious in the war. We came back literally feeling on top of the world. So we wanted new and different architecture. And Paul Williams, fit the bill perfectly. Um, here basically is a traditional house with a modern skin put on it. And you can see traditional elements, but you also look at it and go, this is different, this is new, this is innovative, this is fresh. This was done for a very wealthy uh, oil man from Texas. Here's the back of the house. Now, I want you to notice the front of the house, just a few windows, but the back of the house, look at all those windows the family could then be oriented to the backyard and take advantage of the swimming pool, which the swimming pools exploded after World War II in popularity. But isn't it interesting how the front is rather subdued and in the back, you have a whole different lifestyle to take advantage of. Here's the staircase. Again, a traditional Paul Williams curving staircase, but with a modern touch. Um, this also applied to commercial projects. He was responsible for the, de the design of the Saks Fifth Avenue building in Beverly Hills on Wilshire Boulevard. It's still there. The mandate was a very elegant department store that looked as if you were in your very elegant home. But look at the image on the left, the round portico, the uh, pediment, the triangular pediment over the front door, the use of very few elements. It's very, very elegant and rather romantic. And yet if you break it down, there's just a few things going on. We're inside now and the look was a very elegant ladies dressing room. The same applied for W and J Sloan, a very famous high-end furniture manufacturer. Um, that was prominent until about the mid 80s until it finally went out of business. But notice that th this, 
The building's still there, although you don't see the W and J Sloan uh, moniker there, uh, but it's on Wilshire Boulevard, I believe at about Roxbury. But look how elegant uh, that building is. Again, very few materials used over and over again. And then notice the pediment over the entrance that signified the entrance to the building. Now, I'm gonna go back just a couple of images. This is important because you'll see this. When I mention it, you'll, you'll, you'll see it over and over again. Notice the pediment there, that's a closed pediment. It's a solid pediment, okay? It is a triangle. Nothing is cut out from the, in, from, from the middle. Look at this pediment, the middle's cut out. Why is that? It's symbolic. When the middle's cut out, it's to symbolize, actually the, the pediment symbolizes the Roman empire. Yet when the, the fall of Rome happened or the, the pediment was taken apart, and the middle was taken out. It's to symbolize that all great nations, republics, all great um, um, uh, governments, they can fall apart. That's the symbology. You have to treat them with care and respect and dignity, or they're going to fall apart. That's why you have a what's called a broken pediment. It's to symbolize what can happen if you don't take care of business. And that's what's happening right now in the world. Isn't that interesting? You'll see that pediment on buildings, but even more so on furniture. You, you will see it everywhere now that I mentioned it. Here are some interior uh, showrooms of the Sloan's company. I used to go there as a little boy with my grandmother to San Francisco. They were th That's where you went for good furniture. And uh, Paul Williams was also responsible for Perino's restaurant. This was on Wilshire Boulevard at Bronson. It existed until about 15 years ago. Unfortunately, now there's an apartment building there. Um, but this was where you wined and dined. Um, this was like saying Chasen's, which Paul Williams also designed. But if you were somebody, you went to Perino's. And look inside. Look at the ovals and the curves and the upholstery. Everything is soft and smooth and elegant and romantic. Uh, we're going to finish up here with the Golden State Mutual Life Building, which is still there on the corner of Adams and Western. Um, this was a Black-owned insurance company, and you should read more about this. This is, I believe, on the historical register, uh, but many Black businesses flourished, including Broadway Federal Savings, which Paul Williams was a founder of, and the, the, there were some very smart business people that catered to, to black business and did very, very well. If the whites weren't gonna let him in, the blacks said, you come here, and there was a lot of prosperity. Uh, right here is Beaumont Drive in Beverly Hills Post Office. This was built for Frank Sinatra. This was a swinging bachelor pad with every electronic convenience known to man at the time. You should really go on Google and, and go, or YouTube and, uh, or Google um, Frank Sinatra's um, Beverly Hills home. It's, uh, there may be the, uh, you can find the Edward R. Murrow interview. He was a very famous journalist broadcaster from New York City, and he would interview celebrities in their home, which was innovative in the day. And he, um, Frank Sinatra takes you on a tour of this house. It was incredible. And then of course, uh, Paul Williams was also responsible for the first AME church in um, South LA. And all these images and more are contained in our book that came out on February 1st. Paul R. Williams is part of the Master Architects of Southern California series and more books will be coming. And on this particular book, it was Mark Appleton, Stephen G and myself worked on this. These books are expensive to produce. We make no money on them. Our goal is to memorialize all the great architecture in Southern California. Unfortunately, the bulldozer will win. And in 100 years, I'd like to think of some kid finding this book you know, in Kansas in a used bookstore, and he or she can see how wonderful Los Angeles was. I'm all for pre preservation. It's a tough sell in Los Angeles where there is so much money that dictates what is built as opposed to what should be saved. It's a real tough balancing act. 
but hopefully we will bring some recognition to some great architecture um, in, um, in Southern California. Our sponsor for this book was Gary Drake Construction for the Roland Coat book. That was uh, Russ Diamond of uh, the plumbing company in Santa Monica. And then we also had Michael Grosswent, a contractor on the West Side who sponsored our Wallace Neff book. So only with the generous support of our sponsors are we able to do these books. They're all available on amazon.com. And if you do buy local, I would certainly appreciate it. We need to support our local businesses more than Amazon at this moment. But however you get it, you're gonna learn a lot about the best architecture in Southern California. And thank you. I think uh, we probably have some questions and answers. Thank you so much, Brett. We had so much activity in the chat. I don't know if you got a chance to Good. see. And actually, I was busy talking. I wanted to go fast. So you could, you know. <laughs> yeah, there's um, everyone has been chatting in the chat, you know, like having a lot of wonderful reactions to um, to your stories. And actually, Robin Spark said that her uncle was the pastor of the Second Baptist Church in the 1990s. Oh, wow. I love see these interesting stories all come out of the cracks when you present these of stories you would never know or hear. I love it. I love it. Now, uh, someone asked, um, Eleanor Schrader asked if uh, you could talk a little more about the steel house. Is That's a new one for her, which even I'm surprised to hear that. <laughs> oh, 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 Eleanor, that, that was a big exhibition. I believe there were about five homes, maybe eight uh, prominent architects, each did a different style home. And then the public was invited to tour them. They, it was on Wilshire Boulevard. It was actually 5900 Wilshire Boulevard. And before, the, before that 33 story building was built, and um, multiple homes were built by prominent architects. The public was invited. It may have been done with the Los Angeles Times and you toured your favorite house. And then when the exhibition was over, all the homes were dispersed around Los Angeles. Uh, basically they were moved um, you know, to where they are now. But the steel house was fascinating because of the materials that were used. I mean, whoever thought of a steel house? Thank you, Brad. Sure. Thank you, Eleanor, as well for asking that. Now, Brett, I had a I had a personal uh, question myself. Um, how hard is it to acquire one of these properties um, when they if when they you know if any of them come on the market? It's easy. Just write a ten million dollar check. It's yours. <laughs> oh man, <laughs> not hard at all. <laughs> yeah. I really hope I really hope they don't keep getting bulldozed because that you know they're so beautiful. You know, it's it's unfortunate. Um, if you're in a historical zone, that helps quite a bit, but there is just so much money on the west side that you can basically damage your home in the middle of the night to the point where it'll never come back and say, oops, I'm sorry, and then finish the job later, and then the house is gone. They just did that with um, uh, Ava Gabor's house on the corner of Sunset and Delfern. And it was landmarked, it was registered, it was everything you possibly can. And in the middle of the night, the owner damaged it to the point of uh, uh, it, that it's never coming back. I just drove by there a few hours ago. It's leveled, it's gone. Oh man. Beautiful it's Southern summer. Colonial, yeah. Marla Guess asked, um, she said she was sad about the Tudor in Toluca Lake and why? Yeah. Yeah, the, 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 there's no historical pre preservation over there. The lot is so valuable that someone is willing to do whatever it takes to get rid of the house and build their newest monstrosity. It's a story we keep seeing all over LA. Right. You know, and people wouldn't mind teardowns if what was built was beautiful and, and something to stand the test of time for a hundred years, but they build this crap to fulfill their egos. And it's, it's a slap in the face um, to our visual senses. And then that house will be torn down again. And look at all our wonderful resources that get wasted. Man, so unfortunate. Mm -hmm. This yeah. house, by the way, the, on the cover, uh, it's only on its second owner. The, the current owner bought it in 1960 for $85,000. Wow. Yeah, not fun. And how much, um, I'm curious as well, how much do, if a Paul, well, I know you said 10 million, but um, is there a typical range that a Paul Williams home, you know, goes goes for? Yeah, you're basically looking at $5 million. The $10 million ones will be in Homeby Hills, um, more West Side, but Hancock Park, uh, Windsor Square, whatnot. If, if you're at about 5 million, you can, you can get an extraordinary Paul Williams house. Oh, amazing to hear that. 
I just mm-hmm. gotta right have a five million dollar check ready to go. <laughs> but then you'll need a million dollars to decorate it. Yes, yes. <laughs> well, does anybody else have any questions that you'd like to submit in the chat? We had so much activity in the chat all all throughout the evening. Um, well, is there anything else? I think that is all for tonight, Brett. Thank you so much. This was so you know, wonderful. Um, I'm going to do a stop share, and I've got one final comment. I'll stop the share and then I should be back. Okay, there we're back. Um, I knew I'd be doing this for, for a couple of weeks. And so I wanted to, you know, my, my thoughts were, 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 were swirling um, because 30 years ago, you know, I was at the design center in a really good spot. I never wanted to be a designer, but I, did, but I, but I love the industry. And what I saw over and over again, because we interacted with a lot of students and the students of course were, you know, 18 to 80. That, that, that's what was so interesting is you had a big broad range and so I interacted with lots and lots of people as I said earlier it's probably one of my fa- most favorite jobs is as I look back if you know looking back always gives you the, the answers as far as you know if you could look back how would you do it again but I would say as far as students who are really design oriented work go get a job with the best designer or architect you can possibly imagine do anything and work for that person for two years that will ignite your ability to greater heights, or it'll tell you it's what you don't wanna do. Maybe you want to excel in the showroom arena. Maybe you love the administration of design. You know, design and architecture is a big business. And I see those practitioners blow it over and over and over again. Phenomenal talent, but they don't know how to run a business. And that's why it falls apart. So if you're, you know, a 20 something year old student go work for a few of the best people you can possibly imagine. That'll fine tune where you're supposed to go. But if you've got designer architecture in your soul, you have to express it. There is no way you can't. You just have to find the right avenue to express it in the best way possible. That's amazing. Thank you so much for that advice. That's wonderful advice. And the age, it, it still all applies. We still have students ranging from, you know, 18, 19, all the way through, you know, as, as old as you can imagine, everyone is here still eager to learn. Yeah. But just, just link up with someone who's the top and that's going to propel you. Amazing. Thank you so much. Sure. You're welcome. All right. Well, thank you everyone for joining and for your spending a a little bit of your Friday evening. Um, And uh, yes, we will see you at our next event. Thank you so much. Hey, thanks everybody. Mm -hmm.